Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. I'm energized to be back here again with CPHA, speaking with public health students and grads, this time on the topic of career readiness in nonprofit sector. There are many exciting opportunities for PH grads to contribute in nonprofit, but they're not always as clear as those opportunities that are available in other sectors. So today my goal is to shine a light for you all to help you learn more about nonprofit opportunities and tips and to help you decide if this is a career you'd like to pursue. To be really transparent, I have a bit of a cough today and uh, I'm going to do my best not to let it interfere with the presentation, but just so you're aware. So um, a few different perspectives that I bring to this talk today. The first is the perspective of the local employer. I've worked in public health at multiple levels, um, as Emma mentioned, across nonprofit, public and private sectors, all within British Columbia. This includes as a public health director in Fraser Health, which is the fastest growing health authority, as director of specialized family supports in a larger community nonprofit, which is my current role, um, and also as manager of clinical services in a medium-sized private health organization. I also hold an MPH degree, like many of you, an MBA, and have other clinical and management certifications, and I've held senior leadership and board positions as well. And finally, I've mentored, supervised, taught, and advised many uh, public health students and graduates over the years, and I've learned through these experiences what some of the common questions and concerns are regarding careers. Um, and the opinions I'll share today are my own. Uh, today I'll provide a local nonprofit employer profile, overview local jobs that can be suitable for public health grads, compare nonprofit versus public sector uh, careers, and offer some tips for your consideration. So first of all, Family Services of Greater Vancouver, where I currently work, was established in 1928. From our humble beginnings of one caseworker over the last 91 years, we have grown to over 400 employees providing over 80 programs to children, youth and families across the lower mainland of BC and beyond. Our vision is brighter tomorrows in which all people are resilient, confident and filled with hope. And our mission is to ensure children are nurtured, youth find optimism, adults feel empowered and parents make choices that build strong families. Our values that you see here, we strive to live every day. Underneath our um, umbrella impact that we strive for of health and resiliency for all of our communities, we also have four impact areas. Those are building stronger families, supporting youth in overcoming homelessness, ending violence against women, children and seniors and developing more inclusive communities. This is our governance structure in FSGV. This is typical of many nonprofits where we have a board of directors who oversee governance, strategy, and risk management, a CEO, um, sometimes also called an executive director, who is responsible for overall operations and implementing the strategic plan, and then a senior leadership team, which I'm part of in FSGV, reporting to the CEO. Our board of directors operates under bylaws and is considered a policy board with an oversight role. Some nonprofits, particularly smaller ones, have a management board that is more hands on with operations. FSGV programs are grouped into five service delivery portfolios, and those are specialized family supports, counseling and trauma, victim services, youth services, and community education and development. We also have a few different administration portfolios like HR, finance, quality assurance, and fund development. In a smaller nonprofit, the structure can look different in that you're not likely to have as much admin 
you'll typically have a smaller number of people wearing more hats, taking on pieces of these functions like HR, finance, IT, off and off the sides of their desks. FSGB currently has 440 employees with roles spanning service delivery, administration, and leadership. Within service delivery, our largest role types tend to be counselors and child and youth workers. Within our admin area, the largest teams are HR and finance, which makes sense given our size. And in leadership, we have a variety of program coordinators, supervisors, managers, and senior leaders. So what do we look for in terms of competencies in the people we hire? Well, collaborative communication is a big one, and this includes teamwork, uh, diversity, respect for diversity, and cultural agility. Personal effectiveness includes things like integrity and ethical behavior, but also adaptability and flexibility, which is really important in nonprofit in particular, and a commitment to learning. Personal leadership includes influence, taking initiative, judgment, critical thinking and decision making and creativity. Commitment to excellence includes being client centered, planning, organizing, having professional expertise, and also technological proficiency. And finally, innovative. This means being courageous and maintaining the ability to work hard to truly make a difference to social problems. Through my work in FSGV and through my membership on boards and committees in nonprofit, I have a sense of the technical skills that are most in demand across the sector. Significant are project management and change management. There's also facilitation, analysis and quality assurance skills that are valued and all of these technical skills are generally transferable from other sectors. I get lots of questions from PH grads on what are suitable jobs in nonprofit. First off, more so in nonprofit than in public or private sector public health, titles and roles tend to be non standard. The same type of role can be called many different things in different agencies. So just be aware that generally speaking, you need to do a bit more digging to confirm if a role is a fit for you. I'll highlight a few jobs that could be suitable, provided of course that the role specific requirements are met. Service delivery. Um, a, a really uh, interesting role that uh, could be suitable for public health grads is a community engagement lead. So this is a, a person who facilitates community and stakeholder engagement uh, on issues of importance to the community. And an example would be financial literacy. This is a terrific role in that there's lots of opportunities to link with um, addressing social determinants of health, such as poverty. An operations lead is, can also be a great fit for a PH grad provided it's general operations and doesn't require um, additional specialized training. And under administration, policy analyst can be a good fit if you enjoy working more behind the scenes, uh, doing research and writing reports. Quality assurance specialist, coordinate implementation of quality standards and accreditation. And project managers are a good fit for PH grads who also have project management training. Under leadership, program coordinator and program manager positions can also work well for PH grads in certain content areas. So now I'll, I'll compare local nonprofits versus public sector public health careers. Of course, this is generalized and individual organizations may differ from this. One thing that motivated me personally to return to the nonprofit sector after 10 years in public sector uh, health is the opportunity to have a broader influence on social determinants of health. Healthcare overall is acute focused and tends to be a quite political. What can be refreshing about community nonprofits is you tend to have more space in your mandate to advocate and act on serious social issues. 
community nonprofits are also often values based and do uh, they engage in values based advocacy. Often this includes a commitment to social justice, equity and inclusion. Sometimes in the public sector, values are articulated really well, but they are not always as deliberately focused on day to day as they are in nonprofits. And another major benefit of community nonprofits is that although they generally can't offer the salaries that other sectors can, a strong employee voice in planning and decision making is a distinct benefit that can be offered. And finally, nonprofits are generally more flexible than um, health authorities, which tend to be larger and more bureaucratic. Nonprofits tend to foster creativity, which means a lot less red tape. Health authorities need a certain amount of red tape due to their size and structure. In nonprofits, because things are generally leaner, you can often take on projects beyond the scope of your role. And this is great if you're looking to build your experience. I sometimes hear people say that there are no advancement opportunities in nonprofits. I think it's really that career opportunity or career paths aren't necessarily linear and defined like they tend to be in the public sector. It can take more initiative on the part of the employee to seek out opportunities. And of course, this is easier in a larger nonprofit like FSGD. An example is our current vice president of quality assurance, who started with our agency 25 years ago in direct service and has worked her way up through various roles in different parts of the agency to, to the VP level. Is there more stability in PH organizations in the public sector than in nonprofit? Yes. You're probably not going to worry about a large health authority shutting down. In nonprofits, it's said that we live and die by our contracts. This generally means that you need to be okay with more uncertainty if you want to work in the sector. Salary and benefits do tend to be lower in the nonprofit sector as compared to the public sector. Some nonprofits also don't have pension plans. Fortunately, um, larger agencies like FSGD do tend to have them, but you'll want to research and, and factor total compensation into your career decision making for sure. Some more questions that I've themed from the public health students and grads I've supervised and mentored are here. I covered the second question already from a local perspective. And for the other three questions, I'll turn to my final slide. When you're trying to determine if nonprofit is a good fit for you, examine your bigger picture life vision. So not just what you want for your career and your values and your preferences. And I've included some links to websites on a resources slide that you can refer back to later. Think about, are you a more creative, flexible person who likes people, takes initiative, and can be comfortable with some ambiguity and uncertainty? Generally speaking, that's the nonprofit profile. If you already know that you want to pursue a career in nonprofit or, or you're really seriously thinking about it, consider your current network and your memberships. If needed, you'll want to expand these to include your desired nonprofit employers and associations. And I've included some examples for you on my resource slide. CPHA is a terrific organization to belong to. Um, another one is the Canadian College of Health Leaders. Even though I'm not in healthcare any longer, I maintain my membership in CPHL. They have student rates available. And they also have emerging leaders chapters in different provinces that you may want to check out. They offer networking and career seminars similar to CPHA. Um, um, and these are aimed at the early to mid career professional. Make sure you update your social media to your LinkedIn, your Instagram to reflect your goal of moving into nonprofit if that's what you want to do and your transferable experience. Create saved job searches to notify you of opportunities that meet your criteria. Uh, Charity Village is a great nonprofit job site. Do your research. Initiate informational interviews with employers you're interested in. Request job shadowing opportunities. 
attend seminars. And if you're thinking of applying for a job somewhere, research the organization's leaders as well as the organization itself. Particularly look at the person you'd be reporting to. You especially want the relationship with your boss to be a good fit. Volunteering is another great way to break in and learn about nonprofits and different agencies. And most nonprofits are, you know, crying out for volunteers. Consider roles that can expose you to diverse areas. And a really good example is a project manager. I was a project manager and a strategic change consultant during part of my time in the health authorities. And it was really great for learning and also for building relationships across the organization. For this, you'll need actual project management training, which is available through the Project Management Institute. Here's the resource page I mentioned that you can refer back if you want to. And that's it. Thank you. Karen, that was an absolutely terrific presentation. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm cursing you though, because you hit you hit all my highlights already, and I'm trying to uh, rewrite uh, my uh, presentation as we go. But I won't do that. And actually, it'll be interesting to see where uh, there is some overlap. So Karen's coming from a local uh, organization, uh, but I would say mid-size. Um, compared to to government uh, 400 over 400 employees is is uh, well huge compared to CPHA but um, small compared to uh, some uh, provincial health authorities I'm coming from a national perspective but a much smaller organization um, so uh, it'll be interesting to compare and contrast uh, those so um, give you a quick uh, idea of what my career path looks like it's a very straight line uh, and it's I almost think I must have been born in the 1950s because uh, it doesn't happen very often anymore that uh, you can spend your entire career in one organization. Uh, and it's pretty rare that you can start as a secretary. Yes, I was actually called a secretary. That's how old I am. Uh, and uh, eventually become, become the executive director. But my career path actually belies the common myth that there isn't uh, opportunities for advancement uh, in uh, non-governmental organizations or smaller non-governmental organization, uh, organizations. <clears throat> so uh, back in the 1990s, uh, when I joined CPHA, uh, we were really a project shop. We were a much larger organization. We had over 80 staff. We had a number of uh, multi-year, multi-million dollar uh, domestic and global public health programs. Uh, we had a, a broad range of staff from, from clerks who were processing orders for the information centers to MDs who were organizing uh, Canada's international immunization program. Uh, we operated, had activities in about 25 different countries at any, at any given point. And so there was a really broad range of staff with uh, different skill sets doing a lot of different jobs. Um, so it was a really exciting time to be part of the association. Um, of course, times change, our relationship with governments change, uh, and uh, more importantly, governments' perspective, their attitude towards non-governmental organizations uh, change as well. So we fast forward to 2019. Uh, we're a much smaller organization having a right sized uh, a couple of times, uh, both in the number of staff that we have as well as the floor space that we have. Uh, the number of projects that we have is much smaller. Uh, and that actually gave us the opportunity to reimagine who we were in as, a, as an association. For those of you who aren't as familiar with us, uh, in addition to the project work that we do, we publish the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Uh, we host uh, our own national conference we and we provide conference management services to other organizations. Uh, we, so we do a lot of different things, but when you strip away the things that other organizations could do, perhaps not as well as we do, but they could legitimately, someone else could publish the, or own the journal and publish it. Someone else could host a conference. The thing that no other organization can do is advocate on uh, public policy issues from a public health perspective. 
And so that really forms our raison d'etre today. And as you see from the uh, slide on the screen, uh, we're really active in publishing uh, mostly position statements, some policy statements, some uh, background documents uh, on a wide, wide range of topics that are really crucial to the public health um, uh, workforce today. So um, it really is uh, that, that policy development and advocacy that, that drives us today. We're also a project shop. And so that means we, within a small, small uh, footprint of only 21 staff people, we have some people with very specialized skills. Uh, we do work in uh, stigma reduction around sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. So there's health promotion in there. There's um, uh, different aspects of psychology. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, we have some work around uh, violence prevention for in youth dating. Uh, we're about to uh, relaunch a, a, a big four-year program on uh, substance use and uh, getting Canadians to talk about why they use substances. So, um, and of course, we have ongoing work in immunization. So even within a small organization, there's going to be a need for very specialized skills in addition to the policy analysis work that we do. As Karen mentioned, governance in a smaller organization or a non, uh, not-for-profit organization is typically much more simplified than in a public sector or government uh, position. So uh, for CPHA, uh, we are a membership-based association. So they are in fact the owners of the association, uh, but they elect a board of directors uh, that is responsible for the governance. So as Karen was mentioning again, we have a governance board. Uh, so what that means is they set the policies and regulations by which the organization is supposed to run, and then they task me as the executive director to make sure that those policies and regulations are uh, followed. Uh, we uh, use standing committees to do the pre-board work and then the board approves uh, th that work. Of course, I don't do it all alone. While I am the sole employee of the board of directors, uh, I'm empowered by the board to hire additional staff uh, to do everything else that needs to be done. So uh, a pretty, pretty straight line. So, um, Quickly, some pros and cons of, of working in the um, not-for-profit not sector. Uh, and I think you'll hear some familiarity with what Karen said. Uh, first, generally, yes, there can be less stability. Uh, at the same time, I've been here for almost 30 years, uh, and I'm still standing. Uh, but, but it is true. Uh, it, for our projects, um, Without that external funding, those project positions don't exist, uh, and we uh, can't backfill if uh, there's a, a break in funding. Uh, we try our best to keep good staff on, so uh, we <laughs> recycle staff from one project to the next, even if it's not the same topic, because their skill set is transferable. Uh, but uh, th that is the reality. Um, and of course, we have fewer resources. Uh, we can't just uh, run a deficit uh, and, and not care about it. Uh, we need to uh, uh, mind our resources very carefully. It's financial resources, it's human resources, uh, but it, even within human resources, uh, the volunteers, uh, we have to manage all of our resources really carefully and in a coordinated approach. So sometimes we like the, the expectations of an association uh, such as ours are extremely high but our ability to meet those ex, uh, expectations can be limited now and as we mentioned before like one of those myths that that has some truth to it is that there are potentially fewer internal opportunities for advancement uh, but on that note, I would always remind people to look for opportunities to contribute. That's certainly what I did from the very beginning. Um, not only did I start as a secretary, and I regret every telling the story, but I started as a part-time temporary secretary. I was working for a temp agency. I was only working three days a week. Um, and after two weeks, I said, love the place, would love to continue working here, but I can't afford to work part-time. Uh, is there something else I could be doing or else I'll have to say goodbye? And they found me additional work and I went up to full-time. And within three months, they decided to buy my contract out from the uh, temp agency because I had identified, I had certain skills that they weren't originally looking for, but I saw that I could apply those skills to the work that needed to be done. And I was suddenly feeling a gap and saving them money in other areas. So that ability to identify 
hmm, they're paying an external consultant to do graphic design for conference programs. I actually know how to do graphic design. I could do that for them and I'll, I'll offer that out. And sometimes, uh, yeah, you, maybe for a little while you'll be doing something above and beyond your job description and not uh, getting a financial compensation for that. But typically within an NGO, once you, you prove that you can do it and then the business case is made, uh, that recognition will come. One of the great things about working for a non-governmental organization is passionate employees. You don't come to work at CPHA because of the great salaries, the incredible benefits, and of course, the luxurious pension plan that we have. I'm being sarcastic. We don't have any of that. But uh, you, you do find at CPHA a lot of people who are really committed to public health, to social justice, to actually uh, making a change. And so we've had people who worked in government and they wanted to have more of an impact and so um okay so some of them said they came to cpha to stick it to the man i, I take that as they're just passionate and they want to have an impact um another great uh, thing that uh, karen mentioned is that typically we have a lot less bureaucracy there's less red tape in, in getting things done so if you are really motivated to make change and, and see things happen in a relatively short period of time whether it is a uh, initiating a new project or developing a partnership or hosting an event these things can happen quite quickly um, and and even within cpha like that transition we went from being 80 plus staff to only uh, about 21 staff, um, we had to get rid of layers of the, the few layers of bureaucracy we did have to reflect um, the, the, the new organization that we had become. Of course, uh, in public health, um, you have this incredible opportunity uh, to uh, bring a social justice uh, lens to the work that you do. Uh, it's not just about health, it's so much more, it's about the conditions that create health. Uh, and so, once again, I think that speaks to the passion uh, that you have for uh, the work that you want to do. And again, another point Karen raised was you have the ability to advocate. Um, in uh, in the public sector, your job as a, a civil servant is to uh, provide the best advice to decision makers and then implement those decisions. Now, there is an element of advocacy, uh, if done well, in how you provide your advice. It can't be biased advice, but uh, you are advocating for a specific position based on the evidence that you present. Uh, but what you won't be able to do is uh, if the decision makers make a decision you don't agree with or it goes against the evidence, you can't then write an op-ed or call up your local TV station and do an on-air interview uh, or really speak out against the government because, um, believe me, they frown upon that. So that's the great thing about uh, working for a, a non-governmental organization is that you do have that voice uh, for uh, speaking out. And then there is a great opportunity once you're working within an NGO community, especially um, like if you were in Ottawa, where there are so many uh, health focused NGOs, is there's always that opportunity to make the leap from one organization to the next. Um, uh, we, we build such strong linkages between organizations, you know, uh, who's doing what, who might have a new opportunity coming uh, available to you, and there's a great deal of flexibility. Now, I also say it, it works against CPHA every so often. Uh, we're renowned for like being a great training ground for young staff, and then they get snatched up by larger NGOs that can pay more than we can. Uh, but that's okay. I, I, I can live with that. So just quickly, uh, a little bit of a, a compare and contrast between um, the pros and cons of, of working in a smaller organization uh, versus a larger one. So uh, as Karen mentioned, um, there is a simplified hierarchy um, and uh, this looks very similar to, to, to Karen's uh, uh, org chart as well. Um, so there's my position, the executive director, and then I have my reports. And some of, as I say, we're a really small organization. Some of those uh, directors do have staff, many of them don't. So uh, it's a very flat organization. Uh, basically anyone in the organization can walk into my office and complain or make a suggestion or come up with a great idea. Uh, and, and 
our office space is in fact one wide open room with with cubicles in it so that ability to collaborate with with your colleagues to know what other people are doing and see if there are synergies for uh, collaboration is great um, as Karen also mentioned, I think NGOs uh, are really um, learning the need to balance um, uh, the perhaps <clears throat> less than stellar pay we can sometimes offer. And, and I don't want to run down the pay too bad. I think we do very well. I think in some cases we do better than the private sector. Uh, it's hard to complete, compete always with the public sector, uh, but there are other ways that we can um, uh, support a uh, good work-life balance, um, a flexible work schedule, uh, telecommuting, uh, and I think especially our organization, we're really open. You've got a, an idea about how we can do our work differently. Well, let's get it on the table. Let's test it. Let's see if it will work. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't, but at least we'll try it and, and there's no such thing as a bad idea until we prove that it's a bad idea. Working in a smaller organization, you will become a king at multitasking because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done and there's not a lot of bodies to do it. But the upside of multitasking is you get a lot of experience in a lot of different areas uh, and you find out what you like, what you don't like, but you learn things on a regular basis. Um, as you saw from my career path earlier, about the only area that I haven't actually worked in is finance, but I oversee finance. So uh, I've had my finger in every pot and I've learned different skills and different uh, aspects of uh, business management or, or, or the public health uh, along the way. So hand in hand with the lack of resources is you have to be resourceful. You have to find different ways of doing things, uh, finding, um, online services that uh, um, uh, you can have teleconferences that don't cost you an arm and leg, uh, that using um, uh, collaborating with other organizations so that you can pool your resources and to accomplish, accomplish your goals. Um, in a smaller organization, you have to be clear about your priorities. Uh, it's, uh, I know from uh, my own experience in CPHA, there are so many things we could be doing. And we can try to do 12 things and do them all in a mediocre fashion. But if we focused on three things and, and do them in a, a tremendous fashion, I think we're going to have a much greater impact. So uh, that ability to prioritize and understand what exactly are we trying to accomplish and are we the right organization to accomplish that. Um, we often get requested to work in specific areas and, and we've often said, like, uh, or we do say, there's areas where we need lead, those, there's areas where we collaborate, and there's other areas where we follow. Uh, tobacco control is a great example of that. Uh, in the 70s, there were not a, a, a lot, there were no tobacco control specific organizations. And so CPHA was a lead in that area, lobbying for um, uh, changes to bylaws, uh, changes to um, uh, smoking on airplanes, things like that. But as the smoking, uh, the tobacco control um, community grew over time, they became more organized and then we walked side by side with them. And then for a while, we put our energy in a different area and let them continue to do that work. Now we're getting back and working more collaboratively in tobacco control right now with, with the advent of vaping and, and the nastiness that that industry has brought to us. So, and it changes over time. So um, priorities are never uh, set in stone forever and ever. Um, they're always flexible. Working in a smaller NGO, you have the opportunities to take initiative uh, that, uh, is outside your job description necessarily, but it's a, a passion project or, or an area that you, you really want to develop some skills in. And that doesn't happen in other uh, settings as much because there's much greater definition around job descriptions and, oh, you can't do that, that's somebody else's job, or you don't have the authority to do X, Y, or Z. Um, you want to do something and it's broadly within the mandate of the organization and, and you're willing to take it on in addition to your, your regular activities, go for it. Let's see where it goes. Uh, sometimes it's, it's successful, sometimes it's not. 
partnerships are absolutely essential in, in our work and uh, it's developing those partnerships is a skill, maintaining those partnerships is an even more important skill, uh, and making sure that all partners are happy in the relationship uh, is absolutely uh, essential. So just in that, uh, we have a whole skill set that is, I think, really important no matter where you're going to work. It's important in your everyday life to be able to collaborate with people to accomplish common goals. Uh, and so uh, you get lots of experience doing that uh, in a smaller NGO. The other thing that um, you see, I think, much more rapidly is um, the impact of your work. I think you see results in a smaller NGO uh, and in non-governmental organizations at large uh, much more clearly than you will in a larger uh, agency and in the public sector. Uh, my example is always um, the, do you want to be the big fish in a small bowl or a small fish in a big bowl? Um, years ago, I had a colleague who ran a, um, a needle exchange service for a local community health center. And uh, that was incredibly important work. It was saving people's lives. It was reducing the burden of uh, infectious disease. Um, and, and it was really changing the lives of the people who were using that service. And to me, that's like kind of the, the, the top of the food chain as far as impact goes. Uh, but this person chose to apply for a job with the federal government uh, and still working at uh, uh, HIV prevention, but at the national level and in a national funding model. And we talked about it one day is like, and he had kind of had the experience of, of making um, small change at the local level that had a big impact and he wanted to see what it was like to have small changes over a long period of time at the national level that the potential of which were huge so it really depends on on where your your pleasure center is <laughs> now or later so it's 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 a um, it's really just a choice neither one is right or wrong the the sum total is that um, by working in a not-for-profit or non-governmental organization, you're going to develop all of these different skills and competencies, and they're going to serve you well no matter where you go. So if you're at the start of your career, I think it's a great training ground for um, going back into academia or going into government or what have you. If you've been in government, you have a skill set. Uh, that can be applied to the NGO community and you suddenly have a different perspective on what can be accomplished uh, in, in with different kinds of resources and a different um, skill set. But you will still, you will hone those skills that you have and redefine them in that new context. As Karen mentioned, if you want to get involved with a non-governmental organization, look for volunteer opportunities. Uh, it's a great way to know, get to know the organization really well and get to know whether or not it is the right fit for you. Every NGO has its own culture and you don't know what that culture is going to be until you get in there. There's a lot of commonalities in the cultures, but they can be very different. So there's a lot of different opportunities uh, to get involved with CPHA if you're interested. Uh, and hopefully this gives you a little bit of a feel for uh, what it can be like to work for an NGO. I'll turn it back to Anna. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we're now on to the Q&A period and uh, a, a number of questions have already come in, so thank you. And, and for those who haven't had a chance to post them, now is the time to do so. We have uh, about 15 more minutes to go. Um, so we have a question here. How well does the Canadian NGO sector recognize transferable experience from outside of Canada? Um, Karen, I don't know if you want to tackle that one first or... Um... Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that question. Um, it, we have a number of staff members. So first of all, I'll say that we have a very um, multicultural clientele in family services, and that's true of many nonprofits. We, you know, just within my own portfolio, our staff speak 20 different languages, and they have training in a number from a number of different countries. So, um, 
we are, it's not uncommon that we welcome uh, people to our agency uh, with training that's not from within Canada. That said, it's really important um, that you uh, take care of whatever um, college requirements, if you have a professional designation, that you take care, make sure that you've got your, you're meeting the requirements of your college to practice in Canada. I'm um, thinking if you're a social worker or um, a counselor, for example. Um, but generally speaking, we're very welcoming and actually we, we enjoy and appreciate and value that diversity. No, uh, I'll echo that. Uh, while we don't typically hire a lot of um, professionals who, who require a des designation, that actually makes it easier for us to hire um, foreign trained uh, workers. And uh, it, yeah, it, it improves the diversity of our workforce. Uh, and we've had a lot of um, uh, foreign born uh, staff over, over the years doing a variety of different roles from finance to uh, implementation of our immunization programs. So uh, yeah, it's not a problem for us at all. Thank you. Uh, okay, another question here is that uh, a lot of times in public health, there are niche areas which make it difficult for new grads to join. How does one enter these niche areas without doing voluntary work indefinitely? Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll start and, uh, and Ian can jump in. So I think it goes back to um, your, your networks and, um, and your memberships. So taking a look at who are the people who are working in these areas, um, what associations do or groups do they belong to and sort of infiltrating those um, making connections understanding um, what is needed to work in that niche area maybe there's a gap a skill gap that you just happen to have because um, you want to really understand um, what are the priorities in that area what are the skill sets that they're looking for and then getting to know the people so that would be my, my first recommendation. I agree with what Karen's saying. Uh, I would add that um, what we most often look for is the soft skill set um, that to me is more important. Can you do research? Are you a good writer? Can you communicate well? Um, do you have the personality to work as, uh, work as part of a team? Um, it's great if you have some knowledge or expertise in a subject area, but it's not always essential because typically, especially if we're starting a project, um, an environmental scan is, is almost the first thing that you're going to do, a literature review. So you're going to be brought up to speed. And even if you are uh, have expertise in that area, you're going to be doing that anyway to make sure that you actually do know what the most recent literature in uh, biodiversity is talking about and what those specific issues are. It's more important, can you distill that literature into a cohesive policy analysis or is there, um, can, you, can you apply what you know uh, to do uh, task X, Y, or Z? Okay, okay um, there are a few more questions. Please uh, keep sending them in. Uh, so, Karen, you mentioned that it's a great idea to join the Canadian, uh, Canadian College of Health Leaders, and they have a course called the CHE Select Program, which could be beneficial to many public health professionals who want to shift to a more managerial role. However, the cost is $3,300, which is prohibitive for some uh, young professionals. So any ideas on how we can make these programs more accessible? So, um, so is this, I guess, it, uh, I can answer the question from the perspective of nonprofit sector. Uh, the CHE is not as um, coveted, I would say, in, in nonprofit, um, not the way it is in, in the public sector. So in nonprofit, we look for more um, management fundamentals, and that can be uh, those can be obtained in a variety of ways. 
you, you might have an MBA, although MBAs are not very common in nonprofit. You may have a certificate from um, some of the, the many colleges or universities have nonprofit management certificates. Um, or you may have a certificate program that's been offered through your workplace. You may have attended workshops and seminars demonstrating that you want to improve your leadership. So I would say, I would suggest that in nonprofit versus public sector, we're a little more open to different credentials and not necessarily looking for the higher priced ones like CHE. I agree. Yeah, the only thing I would add here is to explore what funding opportunities might be available for training uh, and professional development. So certain provinces have actual training programs and grants available that you might be eligible for. Um, if workplaces don't offer uh, professional development funds, of course, in the NGO sector, the, you know, the lean um, nature of organizations means mean sometimes that's not available. Yes, and, and just to add to that, Emma, particularly if you are still a youth, I'm not sure if that applies to anyone on, on here, but if up to your mid-20s, there are some bursaries available um, for youth to pursue post-secondary education. Okay, uh, a couple of more questions here, and um, this one is around thought leadership and advocacy, which are um, an important part of being a public health professional. And Ian mentioned one benefit of working with nonprofits is the ability to advocate and contribute to the program. Um, but looking at some nonprofits, it seems there are more opportunities for carrying out tasks than contributing to the thought leadership. Um, and then an example was provided um, pertaining to um, one of CPHA's activities that's making use of volunteers that are helping with some of the more um, operational tasks than um, providing ideas towards the, um, the, the vision and goals of that project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, I think well, first, it, it, it depends on the organization you're talking about. If they are a service delivery organization, yeah, there's often less opportunities for that uh, kind of advocacy. So make sure that you're um, identifying the right organization if, if advocacy is your thing. Um, for CPHA specifically, uh, we have different opportunities. Uh, and certainly as a, as a member, uh, we go out. Uh, we have sometimes different working groups. Uh, we will uh, try to get members involved in the development of papers. It is somewhat challenging. Um, we are finding in the current environment that uh, people who are looking to volunteer really just want to, um, the amount of uh, time and effort that they contribute is is not really what's required. So uh, we've been trying to modify that and giving them opportunities to provide feedback uh, on position statements once they're more fully developed. Uh, but uh, for any member of the association who wants to really get behind a, a, a position statement on a specific topic, uh, you can go through our website. There's a, a, a page where you fill out a form just saying what the topic is, the background, your level of interest. Uh, and you can really drive that development process uh, from, from start to finish. So uh, there is an opportunity. It, it, the challenge is it takes energy on your part to, to really make something happen. Karen, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that question or comment. Sure. Um, just regarding advocacy, in, in my current organization, FSGV, for 90 years, we were um, doing really, really impactful work, but in relative obscurity outside of social services. We were really well known and had a great reputation in social services, but we were less known out there in the public sector, private sector, um, general public. So we've been doing a lot of work around raising our profile in the community, and that means um, speaking through media, um, and, and doing advocacy around our four impact areas that I mentioned earlier. So um, there can be some really rewarding opportunities, even in service delivery organizations, if, um, if, if there's the, the infrastructure to do this, um, to get involved in advocacy uh, at the client level. Um, and we have a number of staff who are very passionate 
who um, share client stories as a way of demonstrating our impact in the community. And we show those, we show videos of those stories at our AGMs and soirees and we um, share them with the media. And, and it's a really great way to, for our staff to have a voice and contribute to advocacy. And then at the same time, we're raising our profile on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. That's great. great, we have time for one last question and um, then we'll wrap up. So from the ground level of work, it seems like you need another practical or technical skill in addition to a public health systems thinking skills um, to really thrive in the industry. What would you say um, is the number one uh, or most needed practical and technical skill um, for the public health industry? I'll, I'll jump off. It's, it's two skills that kind of linked uh, critical analysis and good writing. Um, I can't tell you en enough times, hone your writing skills. Um, it, it's absolutely crucial. Um, you can have the most brilliant ideas, uh, but if you can't communicate that in writing to someone else and in writing succinctly, um, it, it's like you don't have the idea at all. So uh, critical analysis and good writing skills. And uh, what would you say, Karen? So um, I, I'm a really firm believer in, in the project management skill set as uh, it, and it's, it's super valuable and transferable across sectors. There's a real need for that in nonprofit. Um, so and it's, it's not that expensive or time consuming to obtain your credential and it's just an excellent way to add value and then also to get exposure to a variety of different areas. Um, and, you know, I would agree with Ian on the communication front. Um, written communication for sure is important, but then also your verbal communication, conveying messaging that is sometimes complex, conveying that in, a, in an easy to understand way uh, for multiple audiences. Great, thank you. Oh, I oh. just want to, I just want to add into it because it's true. It's conveying complex ideas and being able to edit out, depending on your audience, the stuff that really isn't important. You don't have to tell everything to everybody every time. Um, and anyway, that's a, that's a little mini diatribe of mine. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much.